Assalamu alaikum. Good morning to you all. Uh, we welcome you to the second week of the fourth session of the TRRC. We will start the hearings with our traditional prayers, and I call on Imam Jalo to lead us in prayers. Auzubillahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Rahmanir Rahim Malik Yawmiddin. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'inu ihin nasirat al-mustaqim Shirat al-jina an'amta alayhim ghayri al-mahdubi alayhim wa al-dhalin Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa arzuguna itabahu wa arina batilan batilan wa arzuguna ajiznabahu wa akhfina khamma dunya wa al-akhirat wa arzuguna shahadatuhum wa tawfana ala kamal al-iman wa ala mahabbatim wa tawfai sari ala sayyidina muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Rabbana atina fi dunia hasanatan wa fi lahirati hasanatan wa qina azab al-nar Subhani rabbika rabbil ijjati amma yisifuna wa salamun ala al-musalina wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Amin Thank you Imam We now call on Bishop Odiko to lead us in Christian prayers Thank you Madam Deputy Chairperson Lord God Almighty God of all creation, thou judge of all the whole human race throughout the whole world. As we continue the TRRC sitting at the beginning of this week, we ask that your Holy Spirit will fall down mightily upon us, both on the witnesses who will be testifying and uh, the whole populace who will be listening to the testification that they make and uh, to the commissioners and the legal team, we ask that you will give us the discernment to be able to decipher between truth and falsehood. And we ask that you will also give us the grace to speak out the truth and may your healing and reparation and justice prevail in this nation, the Gambia. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. May I take this opportunity to pray for you, Bishop, and all your flock and all the Christian brethren in the Gambia and abroad that they have a very blessed Holy Week. Amen. Thank you. Did Council? Um, good morning, Madam Chairperson. Uh, good morning, all. All protocols observed. Uh, we are ready to proceed with the next witness. Uh, Ms. Holeja Balagay would lead this witness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lead Council. Okay. Holeja, you have the floor. Good morning, Madam Deputy Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning to you all. Um, can I ask that the witness be brought in? Thank you. I, Babu Kanjai, do swear that. Do swear that. I will speak the truth. I will speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Njai. Please take a seat.
Welcome to the Commission. How are you today? Good morning, Council. I'm fine. Are you comfortable the way you're seating? Yes, I'm okay. comfortable. Very well. As you know, my name is Horaja Balagay. We have met a few times. I will be the one leading your testimony today, asking you questions on behalf of the commissioners. As we have told you on several occasions during interviews with the investigators, you're expected to tell the truth, the whole truth, and lying to the commission is an offense. Do you understand that? All right, Noah, I understood. So you understand that providing incomplete information that could mislead the commission would be an offense? Yes, Council, I understood. And that similarly providing false information would be an offense under the TRRC statute, the TRRC Act of 2017. Do you understand that? I understood, Council. Prior to coming here, you were informed that allegations have been made against you and you were served with a notice of adverse mention. Is that correct? That's correct. And in response to that notice of adverse mention, you provided a response and you signed that statement. Is that correct? That's correct. So let's begin. Um, my objective today is to ask you some preliminary questions about your biographical information. So your personal details as well as your educational and professional background. Thereafter, we will address some of the allegations made against you. Well, we will address all of the allegations made against you, mainly in relation to three incidents. First of all, the torture of security detainees at Mile 2 Central Prisons on or about the 6th of September, 1994. Thereafter, we will address the allegation made against you in relation to November 11th, 1994. And by that, I'm referring to the events at Yundum Barracks, events at Fajara Barracks, as well as the events at the forest. I will also address the issue of civilians who were tortured by members of then Vice Chairman Sanasabali's convoy. Lastly, we will conclude with your arrest and detention. Do you understand that? I understood, Council. Another issue for you to bear in mind is a few housekeeping rules regarding your testimony today. There is interpretation being um, conducted in the local languages. Therefore, you must speak slowly and clearly and avoid overlapping speech between you and me. What I mean by that is allow a few seconds after I finish asking questions before you respond and I will do the same. So we should avoid talking at the same time. Do you understand? Understood, Council. I notice that you're wearing glasses today. Are those sunglasses that you're wearing? These are glasses recommended by the doctor for me uh, since when I was on detention at mile two. Uh, usually I do wear them whenever I feel like and then sometimes when I start feeling some uh, abnormalities with my eye, then I wear them. Well, currently we can't see your eyes, so are you able to do without the glasses for now, or do you need them in order to testify? Yeah, I will need the glasses because I have uh, some papers with me which I would like to, s to look at during the questioning. So let me suggest that you take them off now, and whenever I need you to refer to a statement, then you can put on the glasses in order to aid you to read whatever I put before you. 
Is that fine with you? It's fine, Council. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Njai, let's begin with your name. Can you state your full name for the record? Awazi billahi mina shaitani rajim. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, uh, councils. Good morning, members of the audience. My name is Babukar Njai. Mr. Njai, are you known by any other names? Do you have a nickname, perhaps? Uh, up to now, up to now, uh, some soldiers do call me uh, the chap, the chap, uh, or others. It was from the TRC that I had the name Jai Ponkal uh, constantly being called up to me. Uh, otherwise, up to now, the name that I was being called which uh, by some soldiers is the chap. So if I understand you correctly, the chap as well as Njai Ponkal are names that have been used to refer to you, correct? Uh, specifically with Njai Ponkal was not a name which uh, soldiers know me of. Uh, Njai Ponkal was a name given to me by uh, Alaji Kanyi. Uh, Alaji Kanyi was, was, was my senior. Was, he was one of my Saxon commanders at that time in Yundum in 1992 uh, because I was active in sports at that time and also I do heavyweight lifting. So that was why he used to call me this name. And in fact, I remember that time he was the only one who called me this name, uh, Ponkal. He doesn't call me Jai Ponkal, he called me Ponkal. You know, like when I come from the gym to the company line area, when he look at me at a distance, you hear him, you hear him shouting at me, you know, Ponkal, Ponkal. So the connection of Jai Ponkal, I had it here. Uh, during some of the witnesses' testimony. So he was the only person who usually called me this punkal at the time when we were in the same company in Yundum. So, but mainly the name that's not all soldiers, but soldiers who are used to me, uh, you know, are the ones who normally call me the chap. And in fact, that name was not uh, a famous name. No, this name was called to me by few soldiers, like I said, soldiers who are, uh, who are, who are f like, who I am friends with and who are very close to me. Thank you for that explanation. So just so we're clear, when soldiers refer to Njai Pankal or Dicheb, they're referring to you, correct? Yes, Council. Can you tell us your date and place of birth? I was born on the 13th of June, 1972 in Kau. <clears throat> tell us a bit about your educational background. I when started, and where, just a second, when and where did you go to school? I started my schooling in Kau primary in, 19, you, mm -hmm. in 1980. From there, I come down to Josuan primary. Up to 1984, then proceeded to back with primary. Then from there, started the common entrance examination. From there, I proceeded to Sukuta secondary up to 1990. So, upon completing Sukuta secondary in 1990, what did you do next? After my Form 4, I was doing a petty trading which was created by my, my stepfather. You know, upon hearing the recruit army selection, I went in and succeeded. 
I underwent all the different process of selection. I, f I was finally shortlisted and given an appointment letter to report to uh, Farafenya Training Depot for training. So you enlisted into the Gambia National Army, is that correct? Yes, Consul. Do you recall your enlistment date? On the 7th of May, 1990. What was your intake number? 14. 14? 14, yes, Consul. So you started telling us about the training that you received when you joined the Army. You mentioned Farafenye. Tell us a bit about the trainings you received and the promotions you had in the Army up until um, your present yeah. current position. Uh, in 1990, uh, on the 7th of May 1990, was the day we started our basic recruit training. This training was supposed to last for four months. But at that time, uh, we had the, BAT, the British military tra training team who were stationed at Yundum. Uh, one of them was uh, Sami Joselos. Usually at that time, Sami Joselos will come to Faja Farafenye training depot uh, every month once to assess our level of training. And then at a time he came and then feel that our performance was not satisfactory. So as a result, we were back squatted for two months, a period of six months in total that we spent uh, during our training. Then after six months training, we came down to Yundum Barracks in preparation for our final uh, our passing out parade. I could not specifically remember the month that we passed out, but when we passed out at Yundum, I was posted at Bravo Company. Then Bravo Company came down from Kudang, newly. Uh, so I was deployed to Bravo Company as a rifleman. I was in Bravo Company from 1990 up to 1993, when I was redeployed from Bravo to, to Admin Company to be an orderly and at the same time a close protection to Lieutenant Colonel Odu. Lieutenant Colonel Odu was one of the Natak Lieutenant Colonel, who was the battalion commander in Yundum. So I was his orderly from 1993 up to July 22, 1994. I want to get a good idea of your progression within the military. So from 1994, you were still a private soldier, is that correct? Yes, Council. When was your next promotion? I was promoted to the rank of a lance couple in 1995. Do you recall when in 1995? No, I could not remember the, 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 the date and month, but it was in 1995. Thereafter, when was your next promotion? Then in 1995, uh, after my promotion in 95, I was there until uh, 2008. Actually, before, after 95, I was demoted to a private. When I came down from State House to Fajara Barracks, uh, while in Fajara Barracks, as a land couple from State House, 
I one time had a small dispute with my company CSM. Uh, money, major left his, I don't know, Lieutenant Cornell, no, uh, Major Money. Actually, at that time, my mom was, was sick. My late mom was sick. Uh, that time, she used to have leg problem. At that time, she was in Kuntau. And then I went to see her, but I stayed for a day, you know, without them knowing my whereabout. My company, when I say them, I mean my company sees them and my platoon sergeants. They didn't know my whereabout because I went to see my mother during the weekend. It was on Friday, I closed. So I was there. Instead of coming down on Sunday, I stayed Monday. Then Tuesday, I came. So when I came, he asked me, where were you? I said to him that my mother got sick. So I went to see her in Kuntau. And I overstayed because Kuntau is too far and transportation, especially on Sundays at that that area was was difficult, so I could not make it to come down to report to work on Monday. So this is why I could not come on Sunday, so I decided to come on Monday. Uh, so he said I should have call. I said uh, I have no means of calling in Kuntaur, because if you know Kuntaur, it's a remote village and there was no accessibility for, for making call at that time, actually. So that was the only thing why I could not call to inform you my whereabout. So he said I should go to the cells, I should go to the guard room. I said to him, no, you said you understood my problem. I explained, he said he understood me, but I have to go. I said, no, but once you understand, then I think that's it. So he, he charged me just on that. He charged me straight away. What were you charged with? Absent without leave, or I was absent from place of duty. So you were charged. demoted. You were demoted as a result of mm -hmm. that incident. Mm -hmm. Back to a private yeah, soldier. Yeah, Can you tell us what was your next promotion after that? And then, after that, I was demoted. I was there for seven years without promotion. During this period, uh, when. Of course, I was, I was, at that time in, at Fajara Barracks, I was one of the most senior private, oh, you call it lance couple at that time. As soon as I was demoted, I, was, I became the most senior private. The first mission to Bissau, I was supposed to be part of it, but I was sidelined. For what reason, I don't know. So what I'm trying to understand is, after you were demoted back to a private, mm -hmm. when did you become um, a lance corporal again? After seven years, I was still a, a private. Into the eight years was the time I, 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 I got my lance corporal again. I start from scratch again. What year was that again, sorry? 2008, 1998. Okay. Mm. And thereafter, did you become a corporal? A lance corporal. A lance corporal. Mm -hmm. What was your next promotion after that? Then after 98, I don't know, I think, I think 2001 or so, I got a corporal. I, I, I couldn't fully remember actually. But I remember having my lance corporal when in 2008, after missing for seven years, the eight year was the time I got a lance corporal. And during this period also, I was never been selected on missions or any progress that the army is undergoing at that time. I just want to make sure that it's clear in the record. You said it's in 1998 or in 2008 that you became a lance corporal. 1998. 1998. Mm -hmm. And then in 2001, you became a corporal. Something I cannot specifically remember the. That's the subsequent years which I was promoted from different ranks, from, from 
corporal to sergeant. I don't know. I, I just... What is your current rank? Uh, warrant officer class two. Do you recall when you became a warrant officer class two? Yeah, I was promoted to the ranks of warrant officer class two in 2015. I noticed that you're not wearing your uniform today. Any particular reason why? I did not wear my uniform because I feel comfortable to be the way I am. Very well. On previous occasions, you were wearing your uniform, so it's different to see you in civilian clothes. You look quite different. Yes, Council. Okay, so let's go back to 1994, when you were a private soldier. In July 1994, were you based at Yundum Barracks? Yes, Council. After the coup, and I'm referring to the 22nd July 1994 coup d'etat, were you assigned to any particular individual to serve as an orderly? Like I said, I was an orderly and a close protection to the then battalion commander, Colonel Odu, from 1993 up to 1994, the day of the coup d'etat itself. I still became an orderly and close protection to Odu. In fact, can you help us with something? We listened to the testimony of Mr. Modu Laminba, and based on his testimony, he was an orderly to Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Odu until 1994. Were you both orderlies at the same time? Yes, ma. And you were an orderly until the coup d'etat itself, or were you relieved of your post before that? I was an orderly until the coup d'etat itself. So thank you for that clarification. What I'm trying to get at now is after you served as an orderly for Lieutenant um, Colonel Odu, the coup d'etat took place. Were you then assigned as an orderly to someone else? The day of the coup d'etat, I was not assigned to any person as an orderly. I'm trying to find out if after the coup d'etat. After the coup d'etat. After the coup d'etat. Yes, Consul. Who were I you was, assigned to? I was assigned as an orderly and close protection to the then Vice Chairman, Sana Sabali. Do you recall when you were assigned to that position? Not actually. I could not recall the actual month. But I, Perhaps I, in relation to the coup d'etat, was it within a few days, within a few weeks, or within a few months? Weeks. It was a few weeks because the day, the day of the coup d'etat, when I came from, when I was asked by Edward Singate to escort. When we arrived at the Denton Bridge, uh, I was asked by Edward Singate to escort Samsidin Sar to Radio Gambia that he's going to make an announcement that soldiers have taken over the country. So when I went there with Samsidin, Samsidin left me at, at Radio Gambia. Then I assumed responsibility for the security of Radio Gambia and escorting the Radio Gambia staffs when they, when they are coming on duty and when they are going on off duty, when they close. Uh, I was there for two weeks into the third week. When I returned back to Yundum was the time I got the information that I was called at the State House by Sana Sabali. So that must have been early August. 1994, when you were assigned as an orderly to then Vice Chairman Sana Savali, correct? You're correct, Council. As an orderly to the Vice Chairman Sana Savali, what was your responsibility? What was your role at the time? As an orderly, I was an orderly at the same time, close protection, like I said, 
to Sana Sabali. My duty as an orderly was to take care of his combat boots only. For the uniforms, we are taken care by the wife. So I make sure that his boots are, are well taken care of. So apart from taking care of his boots, did you have any other responsibility as an orderly? At the same time, after the orderly, I was a close protection, ensuring that his security, uh, he is safe as far as security is concerned. Did that entail going to places with him? Yes, Councilman. Before we proceed, can you tell us about the other members of Vice Chairman Sanasabali's entourage? Who else um, was part of his, his entourage? You mean his orderlies? His orderlies, his um, drivers, bodyguards, all of that. Yeah, I was one of his orderlies. Uh, the second was the second one was Jesse B. Mendy. The third one was Zakaria Dabo. And then you have Mohammed Sambu. Mm -hmm. The drivers, you have Lamin Drame. The second driver was uh, Dembo Jiba. The tri third driver was Alkali Jalo. Say that again. What was the first name? Alkali Jalo. Alkali Jalo. So, JCB Mendy was an orderly. You, Babu Kanjai, were an orderly. You mentioned a Mohammed Sambu, also an orderly. Yes, Consul. Do you know someone by the name of Babanjai? Exactly. I oversighted him. He was also uh, he was also an orderly. Babanjai was also an orderly to Sanasabali. Do you know someone by the name of Zakaria Dabo? I mentioned Zakaria. He was he's he's also an orderly. What about someone by the name of Albert Gomez? Yeah, absolutely. He was. So you've mentioned the orderlies and the drivers. Was there anyone else who was part of Vice Chairman Sanasabali's entourage in 1994? Or these are the only individuals? Yeah, as far as I can remember, these were the only ones. Can you tell us a bit about how his entourage was organized? Did you carry out your duties in shifts or were you all together with him all the time? Initially, like a, a point of correction, like when, we, when you talk of orderlies, uh, these are people who usually take care of Sonos uniforms and boots. That was me and JCB only. The rest were not orderlies, they were close protection. Apart from me and JCB Mendy, the rest were close protection, they were not orderlies. So when you talk of orderlies, it's me and JCB only. So our responsibility as orderlies like I said, was to take care of his boots and uniform. But fortunately for us, we were not taking care of his uniforms, but only his boots. Because the uniforms we are taking care of by the wife, that is ironing them, starching them, or whatever. So it was me and JCB. The rest were close protection. So if I understand correctly, the rest were close protection, you and JCB, were orderlies, meaning you took care of his boots, but you also served as bodyguards as well, yes, right? Yes, Okay. 
So you were about to tell us about how you organize yourselves in terms of shifts. Okay. Please proceed. Uh -huh. Then the two of us as at least initially Sana divided us, that is me and JCB Mendy, that when he is going to the office, like a day like today, Monday, one will remain at the residence, then one will go with him. Then the following day, the other will, the, the one who went to the office will stay, and the one who remain will go with him to the office. That was how we started initially. That was how he initiated it. But later, it was disregarded by him. So we all do go to the office whenever he's going to, to the office. So in the end, there was no rear guard that will serve as a rear protection for the family. You said later. Later when? When did it change such that? Not, not long, not long, not long. It's not more than two months after when we were there. So let's focus um, on the initial period. So you started in August 1994. Looking at the period of August and September, from what I understand, you would take shifts with JCB Mendy in terms of being with Sana Sabali when he went out of the house. Is that correct? Yes, Kaso. Did that change when it came to actual operations? It changes sometimes. Like, it was not specific to say, you know, we all should be going with him whenever he's going out. You know, sometimes he doesn't observe those things to say who will go and who will stay. This was within us. This was between me and JCB. Sometimes I will go when JCB stays. Sometimes JCB will go while I stay. So let me focus your attention on an incident in relation to the Mile 2 Central Prison. Do you recall going to Mile 2 Central Prison while you were Vice Chairman Sanasabali's orderly in 1994? Yes, Consul. <coughs> so tell us about that, starting from the beginning. How did you come to make that trip to Mile 2 and what happened when you got there? Uh, it was one evening that while we were at the vice president's or the former vice chairman's residence in Fajaro, we were asked to, to go, or Sana asked us to go with him. Initially, we did not know where we were going. Uh, we went along with Edward Singate, uh, Yankuba Ture, and Saribu Hyder with their orderlies and close protection. Because Can we list all the names of the individuals that you recall? Tell us their names as well as their ranks. You mean the close protection and the orderlies? Yes, precisely. I was there. Babu Karnjai, we know that you were a private at the time. Who else was there? I can hear you, Council. At the time, we know that you were a private soldier. Yes, Can you tell us who else went yes. with you and what their rank was at the time? Zakaria Dabo was there. I think he was I think he was a corporal. I, I'm not sure. I'm not too sure. Because he came from the Zandam. So but it's like he was a corporal at that time when he was coming.
to join us. Zakaria Dabo, Jesse B. Mendy was a private. Babanjai also, I'm not too sure his rank because he seniored me, but he was also with us. Babanjai. Yes, tell us about everyone else who was there, so the orderlies of the other council members. Hmm. Sari Buhaydara was there. Uh, one of his orderly by the name Lamaran Abari was there. Mustafa Suso was there. Sorry, repeat that name. Something Suso? Suso, I, I don't know. Something, I, I forgot the first name anyway, but it, the, the, the last name is Suso. Does the name Al Fuseni sound? Exactly. Alfuseni Al Suso. Alfuseni. Continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did I mention Lamarana? Okay. Yes, you did. Alfuseni Suso. Yeah, I think these are the guys I remember from from Sadibu. There was one, one, one jersey, jersey. I don't know, something jersey. I, I can't remember the first name. He was also with, with, with uh, Hydera, Sadibu. Who was with Edward Sinyate? Edward Sinyate, you have Marong. I can't remember the first name, Marong. Do you recall his rank? So, sorry, Ma. His rank? Marong, at that time, I think he was a couple. Not too sure. Does the name Lamin sound Lamin. correct? Lamin, Marong, something like that. Are you sure? Because, anyway, the nickname is King Kong. But King I, Kong. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't remember the first name, but the surname is Marong. Okay, mm -hmm. please continue. Uh, with Edward, uh, Mustafa, Mustafa Toure. Mustafa Ture, or the nickname Churo, Churo. Uh, was also part of part of Edward Singer's uh, close production. What about Yankuba Ture? Who was mm -hmm. with him that night? Yankuba Ture, Jelly Musa so was one of them. Jelly Musa so. Uh, Sambaba was one of them. Mm. These are the two I, I can remember. Do you know someone by the name Ensa Mendy? Exactly. Was Ensa. he present that, mm, Ensa that day? Ensa was one of his oddities also. Uh, is cross protection. So apart from the council members and the orderlies that you've mentioned, was anyone else part of the group that went to Mile 2 prison on that occasion? You know, this was at night and uh, it was difficult to, to try to see those who were there actually, the actual people who are there. Uh, but as far as I can remember, the oddlies were there. And, and any other foreign body apart from us, I could not definitely remember. Apart from the council members, was there any other senior officer present that night? I cannot, I can't remember. Do you know someone by the name Peter Signate? Exactly. Was yeah, he present yeah, that he was night? There. He was there. Did he come on his own or was he with someone else? Sorry. Did he have an orderly, for instance? Peter, at that time, no idea. 
Okay, so this is the group um, that went to mile two um, at the time. Can you tell us how this trip came about? You started to tell us that um, you were asked to go to mile two. Tell us in detail who told you about where you were going and why you were going there. Uh, actually, when, when we were going, we were not told as to where we were going until when we suddenly saw ourselves branching into mile two central prison. That was the time we knew that we were going to mile two. Do you recall around what time that was? This was in the night, like uh, after 10 to 11, something like that, 10 onwards. So very late at night? Not very late. Not very, very late. This was around 10 after 10. Do you recall the date of that event? No, no, ma, no concern. Was it within a few weeks or months after you became an orderly to Sanasabali? Months, few months after I became an orderly to Sana. The testimonies that we have heard put it at the 6th of September 1994. Does that sound correct to you? That's correct. Thank you. Tell us what happened upon your arrival at mile two that night. Upon our arrival at mile two that night, uh, the, the, the gates were opened by the prison warders of mile two. Then we went straight to confinement number one. Sorry, number five. We started at number five. When we were about to enter confinement number five, the, the doors were opened by the prison warders. Who do and you recall um, from the prison wardens prison who was present? No, no, you know, I don't know them much. I don't know these prison officers. But I remember that the, the, the doors were opened by the prison warders. But the, because I don't know them, the actual person, I don't know. Be before you continue, were you armed that night? Yes, Council. What type of weapons were you carrying? Your group, that is. I, I know of mine, but uh, like I was carrying a PGL, but the rest. Say that again. PGL. PGL. What mm. does that stand for? A portable grenade launcher. Can you describe the weapon? Uh, this weapon is like an AK-47, but it has a slight difference with the AK-47 because underneath the barrel of the rifle, it has a launcher. So an AK-47 that could also launch a grenade, is that correct? Sorry? An AK-47 that could also launch a grenade. Exactly, ma. Did you carry any other weapon? Apart from that? Apart from that, no, no, no counsel. The rest of your group, were they also armed? They were armed. We were all armed. With similar weapons? Yeah, that's because those type of weapons were not many. So I wouldn't know actually whether we, they were all carrying the same type of weapon like mine. But I know for myself I was carrying that PGL. Okay, so the cells were open, or the wing was open? The wing was open, and then upon arriving at confinement number five, the, the door was also open where we all entered, including the council members. Prior to that, did anyone from your group say or do anything as you were entering confinement wing number five? Say or do? Do anything? Not to my, not to my knowledge. At that point, did you know why you were going into confinement number five? No, ma. Continue telling us what happened. I did not know oh, why we were going. Like I said, until when we enter, we know. Okay, we are going to mile two, and then we went straight. When the gates were open, we went straight to confinement number five. 
you know, you don't have only one door in mile two, you have door on doors. So when we arrive at the last door, that is the door leading to into their cells, that one was also open. We all entered, including the council members. When I say council members, I mean Yankubo uh, Ture and his orderlies, Sana Sabali, his orderlies, Edward Singate, and Peter Singate. So when we all entered, then the council members, I said, Sana Sabali, Edward Singate, Yankubo Ture said that the prison warders should open their cell doors, that the detainees should be moved out from their cells to confinement number one, which they did. Sorry, who moved the detainees? I was one of those who moved the detainees together. So step by step, tell us exactly what you did. Actually, when this uh, cell's door were open, we were asked by the council members to move them while they stood beside us and watch. To move who? The detainees in their cells. Which detainees? The security detainees. Give us some names. Uh, people like Chongan. Which Chongan? Chongan. I think it's Ibrahim Chongan, mm -hmm. uh, Mamad Cham, Mamad Cham, I remember him. Uh, what is his current rank? Uh, he's a general, his current rank is a general in the army. Mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. else? And uh, quite a lot of them. I can't remember all, but I remember Chongan, I remember Mamad Cham, yes. Mm. So tell us exactly what you did. When we received the instructions from Sana Sabali specifically that we should move them to confinement number one, maximum security, which we did. Now when these uh, cell doors were open, some of them like, don't want to come out from their cells. In fact, some of them have to sit flat on the ground. Then we drag them. I drag, I personally drag one of them. I could not remember actually who, because this was an order. And whilst the council members were just standing right behind us, watching. Tell so us how you dragged that person. I hold the person on the hand and then move with him. So the person was lying on the floor, is that not, correct? Not all of them were lying on the floor. Some of them were sitting. We're no, talking they, about the first person that you dragged. Mm -hmm. Was sitting, yeah, they were sitting on the floor. He was sitting on he the floor? He was sitting on the floor, yeah. And you dragged him mm -hmm. by doing what exactly? By moving him from his cell to confinement number one. How did you do that? I hold his hand. Can I demonstrate? Please go ahead. Um, you can carry the mic as well so yeah. we can hear what you're saying. I hold the hand like this and push the guy out from his cell up to confinement number one. You make it sound very effortless, but I assume the person was resisting. Was the person resisting as you were dragging? No, initi him? initially. When the action was about to take place, he was resisting. But when he was moving, he never resisted. Tell us what happened next. Where and did you take the person? We moved them to confinement number one. Just opposite confinement number one, there is a wall. There is a long wall facing direct to confinement number one. That was where they were lined up. The security detainees were lined up. Then the council members, we are talking to them. So just a second. You dragged um, this person up to the wall. Did you say or do anything to the person as you dragged him? Personally, no, ma. 
I didn't say anything. How many people did you drag outside of I this? I dragged one because we were many. And not all the security detainees were moved out. Only few were moved out to that, to that, to that direction, to the, to the direction of confinement number one, whilst others were st still remain in their cells. Did you beat any of the detainees? Personally, me, I didn't beat because, like, when I entered the, the, the wing, the, the, this, the, when I entered their, this, their, their, their area, I realized that most of them were senior officers. Almost all of them were senior officers. Then my consent did not allow me. I feel, how should I call it? I feel guilty to lay hand on them because I realized that these are senior officers that they didn't do anything to me that will warrant me to, to beat them like that. And moreover, I was not, I was not given any order to beat at the initial stage. So why should I beat? So your conscience didn't allow you to beat them, but yes. your conscience allowed you to drag the detainee out of the cell. Is Actually, that correct? The reason, in fact, the reason why I did that, because this was an immediate order passed by Sanasabali, who was right behind me, right behind me. So there was nothing that I can do. You know, I have, I have to drag them, or I have to drag him. That was the only reason why I did that. How long did you drag this person? What was the distance from the from, cell to where you took mm, this person? From their cells to the door of confinement number five. Then they stood up and walked the rest. What is the distance, approximately? This is from their cells to number one. Yes. Like uh, 75 meters. 75 meters? Mm, something like that, approximately, yeah. What was the ground like, the ground that you dragged this person on? Uh, this was a cement floor. So dragging someone on the cement floor for about 75 meters, did you injure the person? It could be, it could be. You said that your conscience didn't allow you to beat any of the detainees. Did you insult any of them? Say again? Did you insult any of the detainees? No ma, like I said, these are, these are senior officers, you know, they didn't, they didn't do anything to me that will, that will earn or cause me to, to insult just like that. So I didn't insult anyone. Because insulting any of them would have been going above and beyond the order that you were given, which was to drag them out of the cells, correct? Mm, that's correct, Council. So if any of the detainees said that you insulted them, they would be lying. Is that your testimony? As far as I, I can fully remember, I was not that type of person. And soldiers watching at me right now can attest to that. I am not praising myself right here, but I want to say that I was one of the most disciplined soldiers in the army up to now. If what I'm saying is true, the soldiers out there can bear me witness. So I, I don't talk much. I always reserve my consent. I always reserve myself in whatever situation. I just found myself to be and oddly to Sana, I don't know how, because I was just called by him, Sana Sabali, that I'm to be an oddly at, at the same time a close protection to him, just like that. Uh, I am not related to him. That will make him to call me before the July 22nd to be an oddly to him. So I am such a person that 
I have high regards for people. And uh, as far as discipline is concerned, I know I was one of the most disciplined soldiers in the army at that time. So you said as far as you remember, you were not that kind of person to insult senior officers who were present at the security wing that night. But I can so. So which means that anyone accusing you of having done so, according to your testimony, would be lying. Is that correct? Yes, Consul. So I'd like to play an extract of a testimony that was given here at the beginning of the Commission's hearing. Let me, um, I request that the OV van plays the testimony of Ibrahim Chongan. You have the relevant extract, so if you could please bring it up and play. So say, and I had all the soldiers. Yeah, where's where, where is, where is Chongan? Where is Chongan? He's the one. He was the one who ambushed us. So Savali came with Antusaidi, the deputy governor of the prison, and he showed me something and I said, "Do you know this?" I, I, I said, "What?" Said, this is blood. And can we hear so the volume? I thought it was blood. He blood Turn up the Captain volume Emotar. so we can hear the sound. So now they opened my cell, and Antu Saidi, who was the deputy prison governor, they handcuffed me from behind. They handcuffed me from behind. We can't hear so the sound. Can you replay behind, the video and increase the volume? <laughs> While they do that, um, Mr. Njai. Can you hear me? While they're sorting out the video, you mentioned that these detainees were dragged. Were they dragged individually or were they dragged one after the other? They were being dragged collectively. What do you mean by that? I mean, each of the oddlies will enter a cell and bring out the guy that you asked to bring out. And they headed to confirming number one. And your testimony is that the orderlies brought out these detainees at the same time? At the same time, simultaneously, yeah. Well, that's very surprising because the testimonies that we've heard from each of the individuals that was dragged out of their cell is that they were dragged separately one at a time. That's what we heard from RSM Jeng. That's what we heard from Mama Cham. That's what we heard from Ibrahim Chongan. That they were dragged individually, one at a time. You're telling us now that they were all dragged together. No, what I mean is not together at the same time. Sorry. Not well, you just said they were dragged together simultaneously. What Simul do you mean by that? When I, what I mean by that is like one, like, you know, whilst the other is being moved, the other follow. You know, like that. Whilst the other one has been, have been moved, then the other one follow. That's, that's what I mean. But not me like bringing them from, bringing them from, are you getting me? Not quite with the mic. Um, can you repeat your answer? Let's see. Yeah, I said not, not, I mean, not bringing them all together from the cells at once, but I said, like, one detainee has been moved whilst the other follow. That's what How I long mean. after, wow. How long after one detainee had been moved did the other follow? Was it a matter of seconds? Yeah, minutes or so, you call it minutes or seconds, yeah. So your testimony is that they were all moved and taken to the wall and they were at the wall together. Is that correct? Not together. You know, at the door, at the entry of their cells, it's not possible for all of them to come out together. But one will come whilst the other follow. The, 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 the one who that comes will be asked to stand. Then after some time, the other one will follow. Because looking at the confine, uh, looking at confinement number five, is is a bit long. You know the cells are in row. 
So coming down from this, from, from who, wherever cells the person may be, to confinement to confine number one is a bit far. That's what I mean. One will come after some time, the other will follow. And according to what you've said, they were all taken and lined up at the wall. Is that correct? It's correct, ma'am. So they were all taken, lined up at the wall, and all three of them were together? Sorry? All of them were together at the wall? Exactly, ma'am. Tell us what happened. Yeah, when, when that happened, when they were all lined up, like I said, then Sana Sabali started shooting very close to them on the ground, but not directly. Started shooting very close to them. And then they were talking to them, but I, I, the council members were talking to them, Sana Sabali, Yankubature. What were they saying to I, them? I, I could not remember actually, but I remember them talking to the detainees. But what they were saying, I forgot. Mm. Describe their behavior towards the detainees. Yeah, their behavior towards the detainees at that time was like they were trying to scare them. They were scaring them, you know, by telling them big, 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 big words. Such as? You know, as we will kill you, such as we will kill you. Mm -hmm. Who said we will kill you? Uh, that, that, that's what I said. Like, I, I, can't, I can't remember. But I remember Sana and Yankubature talking to them, actually. Sana and Yankubature. Mm -hmm. Apart from the two of them, did anyone else talk to the detainees at that point? At that time. I can't remember. So continue telling us. Then we were there until when they were ready, the council members. Then they were asked to, they were asked by the, 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 the prison warders to return them back to their cells. Let's still focus on what happened at the wall. So you said that Sanasavali, um, Sanasavali and Yankubature were scaring the detainees, mm. saying words such as, we will kill you. Did they do anything to the detainees at that time, apart from what they said? If there is anything like torturing, if there was going to be anything done to them, we'll be torturing. But as far as my memory can serve me, I can't remember them being tortured, you know, because this is a long time, like I said. But I can't remember. I remember them being assembled behind the wall facing confinement number one while they were talking to them, and then Sana was you know, shooting indirectly, very close to them. There was no casualty, neither injury. And then I remember Sana and Edwe Yankuba talking to them. Uh, I think this was not mentioned in my statement, but I remember somebody putting a, a, a pistol in the mouth of one of the detainees. I cannot remember actually the guy. But there was who, nothing. Who put a pistol in whose mouth? Yeah, it's like Yankuba Ture. Put a pistol in whose mouth? Yeah, like one of the detainees. I can't remember the actual detainee, because uh, we heard testimony from Mr. Ibrahim Chongan that someone put a pistol in his mouth. Does that sound? Something like could have, because, because Chongan, I did not know Chongan before. I came to know him when I joined them at the central prison, when I was also under detention. That was the time I came to know Chongan. But your testimony is that Yanko Bature put a pistol in the mouth of one of the detainees. Something like that. I'm not, I'm not very much sure. Can you tell us what he was doing? I'm not very much sure on that. But I remember one of the security... Council members putting them, they a pistol on the mouth of one of the detainees. Mm -hmm. 
But the actual passing is what has kept my mind. I can't exhort it. If it is Chongan, then that's it. But I, you know, at the time, I don't know Chongan. I came to know Chongan when, we were, when I was in mile two also. I just want to make sure your testimony is clear. So the person in whose mouth the pistol was shoved could have been Ibrahim Chongan, but you're not too sure. Yes, ma'am. However, the person who shoved the pistol into his mouth was Yanko Bature, according to your testimony. Something like that. Can you tell us what he was doing um, when he shoved the pistol into the detainee's mouth? Like, Did well, he do or say anything when he put the pistol in the mouth of... Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, him and uh, uh, Sabali, we are, we are talking to them, but like what they were saying actually is what I could not remember now. But I remember them talking to them. So you've told us that these detainees were dragged from their cells. They were intimidated as council members scared them, saying words to the effect, we will kill you. Yanku Bature pointed a pistol in the mouth of one of the detainees, possibly Mr. Ibrahim Chongan. Did they do anything else to the detainees? That's what I said. Like, uh if there, was going to, if there was going to be anything, it would be torture. Like, but I, I, I can't remember any of, them, any of them being tortured. The question is, was there or was there not any beating of the detainees? No, there was no beating. Do you recall writing your own statement and providing it to the commission in response to the notice of adverse mention? Sorry? Do you recall writing a statement responding to the allegations that were made against you? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to give you a copy of your statement, and I will refer you to a particular paragraph so that we can read it out into the record. I will give you the original version of the statement. Please take a look and let me know if that is the statement that you signed. Which paragraph, ma? Take a look at page two. Look at the second paragraph of page two. In fact, before you read it, I note that this is something you provided on the 13th of March, 2019. Is that correct? Yes, correct. And you have signed the statement on the last page. Is that correct? And this is a statement that you wrote yourself, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So looking back at page two, let me refer you to the second paragraph on that page. Page two. Yes. Can you push the mic down a little bit so that you can read what that second paragraph says? It starts with, it is important to note. Have you seen it? Yes, I saw it, ma'am. Please read what that paragraph says. It is important to note that only council members participated in the shooting and beating of detainees, which I saw, to my knowledge. No outlets participated in the shooting. The whole, in, this, in the whole aim, and the whole aim was to scare the detainees and not to, to shoot or kill. Hence, why only council members participated and why they shot immediately? Indirectly. They shot indirectly. 
Indirectly, yeah. So just last month, your recollection is that the council members beat the detainees. That's what your statement says. Is that correct? It's correct. It's correct. So how come when I just asked you a few minutes ago if the detainees were beaten, you said no? Yeah. It is, it is, you know, it's the, it is the mind, like, it is the mind. What do you mean by that? This was barely one month ago when you recalled that the council members beat the detainees. You know, this, this statement that I gave here was, was, was my original statement, or my original speech. Like, but subsequently, you know, it can be something like that you over, you forgot or you oversight to mention, but not actually meaning uh, dodging away from what you've previously said or whatever. Because once I wrote this or give it out and it was written down, and then now I am here to testify, does not mean that I am running away because I've already given this and it's in writing where I sign. So asking me does not actually mean that, or asking me and then, you know, you know, failing to mention this does not actually mean that I am running away from telling the truth because I have already said it and it is in writing. So, but it's like I said, it's just the mind to say, you know, why didn't I mention it like the way it is? Because it's already on paper, so it wouldn't make sense for me to say it when it is already down on paper and then coming up and then saying a different thing. It's just the mind. You seem to be struggling to explain that, but the difference here is you said something completely different from what you said in the statement. Mm. It's not that you forgot, but you actually said the detainees were not beaten. No, Whereas I in your statement, you no, said they were beaten. No, I said, I think you asked me whether they were beaten by the Otlis. I said, I asked I, if they were beaten. That was my question. Were they beaten? I did not ask if they were beaten by the orderlies. Yeah, that's why I responded to say, if they were beaten, not to my knowledge. Because I thought you were saying they were beaten by the orderlies. As far as I said, as I said, as far as I'm concerned, I have not laid hand on any of them. That's what I said. In fact, what you said was they were not beaten. But we'll leave it at that. I think it is now clear. Your recollection is that they were beaten. By they the council beaten, members. Absolutely. They were beaten, and like I said, uh, one of them, which I could not remember, uh, a pistol from Yankuba was put into his mouth. But it's now that I know it's Chongan, because I, I don't know Chongan at that time. I came to know Chongan when I was also there, I was detained at mile two. And you've told us clearly that you didn't beat any of the detainees and you didn't insult any of the detainees, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a message for the OV van. I think we can now play the video of Mr. Ibrahim Chongan. So say, and I heard all the soldiers, yeah, where's, where, where's, where's Chongan? Where's Chongan? He's the one, he was the one who ambushed us. So Savali came with Antu Seidi, the deputy governor of the prison, and he showed me something and I said, do you know this? I, I, I said, what? He said, this is blood. So I thought it was blood, blood of Captain Emo Cham. So now they opened my cell, and Antu Seidi, who was the deputy prison governor, they handcuffed me from behind. They handcuffed me from behind. So when they handcuffed me from behind... Uh, let's get that clear. Uh, who handcuffed you? Antu Seidi, who was the deputy prison commissioner. Proceed, please. So he handcuffed, handcuffed me from behind, and then the same thing. They dragged me, they beat me with, you know, boots, rifle butt, you know, and... <laughs> I was crying. I wouldn't be ashamed to say that. And, uh, um, and I said, I just gave up. And I said, wow, this is the end. So I, I just gave up on life. And then suddenly something happened. Then Haidara, because I trained Haidara before, he, I just heard him, he said, be careful. So I was wondering, because I had lost hope on life. 
And I say, oh my God, maybe my life is coming back. If somebody they're going to execute, why, why would they say be careful? So we went there. We went to the security wing number one. Is this the same thing? You know, what do you mean by it's the same thing? Explain what happened. Yes, I'm coming to that. So, um, they, they, uh, Sabali, they said, you know, say your last prayers. And I said, no, I'm not saying any last prayers. I mean, if I die, I'm going to go to heaven anyway. You, you murdered me. So, they, they just started, suddenly they just started firing. Brrr, you know, it, it, maybe it was not long, but for me, it took eternity. But also, I was a trained soldier. I know a bullet that's going to kill you. You will not hear it. But still, I was scared to death. And one of the soldiers had a pistol in my mouth to safety cut, of safety cut down. So, Do you know who that person was? Well, I, I, it's a long time. And there were soldiers there. But I suspect it was, it was, it was Yanko Bature. I might be mistaken identity, but he was there. So... Now, go ahead. Thank you. So now, they stopped the ceasefire, and then the point had gone. There's, there was a private guy who was uh, who was uh, Sana Sabalis oddly, and there was another Zandam who was a private, something Suso. I know him because he was in the Zandam Mori, and this guy insult me. Tell me, and then we crawl, and then went to security wing number one, and then I was put inside the cell and locked up. And then they say, "All right, we will come back for you." So they locked the whole place. And uh, at this stage, did you know what had happened to your other colleagues apart from the fact that they were beaten? No, but I, after they dragged me and took me to the cell, I, I had a hope that maybe they went through the same thing, but they were not executed. But So now I'm in my cell, after what looks like eternity, and I said, Captain Cham, he has a name, they call him Mohammed Betty. So I said, Captain Cham, is, is anybody here? And then Captain Cham, it, like, it took like, ages and then he turned around and said chongs and automatically said are we safe and then i said well captain Cham, i don't know <laughs> in wolof who was who was he referring to when he said chongs oh, yeah. Kansun. but i want to swear by the quran that i started with before my testimony like i said I didn't know uh, Chongan until the time I was at the detention. I was taken to mile two on this detention also. Uh, it has seized me by surprise to hear this from him because I didn't know him either and he didn't know me. In fact, I came to know Chongan when I was there, like I said, and Chongan won, was one of my closest friends whilst we were there. Him. Uh, Mama Cham, Kambi, and Sirif Gomez, if they are listening to me. So it has seized me by surprise for him mentioning my name as to I insulted. I swear to the Holy Quran, and I will swear again that I, I am not those type of soldiers who easily insult. Soldiers are watching at me right now, and they know what I am saying. If I am capable of that, they know. If I am not capable of that, they know. But I am not that type of sol or those type of soldiers who freely speak to people anyhow. Chongan, like I said, these were my superiors. So, you know, without, without anything, I cannot just come and see him and then just insult him. For what reason? Why? Why should I do it? Why? Because you were in a position of power, and no, he was no, weak I was at the not time. In, I, was in the, I was not in the position of power, because I was just an orderly and a close protection. So Chang'an was a detainee. Chang'an was a detainee, yes, Consul. But that doesn't mean that I should do whatever I feel like without an order. 
So why and would Changan say that you insulted him if you That's did what not? doubts me. Wallahi, billahi. This is what doubts me. Because, like I said, Ch Chongan doesn't know me. Chongan, and then, if I did anything bad to Chongan, I don't think Chongan would have accepted me when I was there. Because from my cell, it was direct to their, to their, to their, to their, to their cells. You know, Chongan at that time when he do prepare that breakfast, that morning breakfast, you know, he was the one who usually gave me some. And uh, I think if I would I have well, done anything bad to Chongan at that time, he was not our, going to our, appreciate our me to the extent the of, I think, at confinement number Bunker one, which in Sanas Adlis, I was the only person was him. who so was very close to them pain. when we were all there eventually. I was the um, only person, this was and a very I was moment. one of those who contributed um, not to only the reconcile the Sana and those senior officers at security wing number five, which I succeeded, except Chongan, who said he's not going to accept it because it is Sana who caused them to be there. But the rest, you know, accepted the reconciliation, and then that was where it is. So, so from everything you've told us, by the time Mr. Ibrahim Achongan testified in January of this year, he would have known who you were. So he identified you clearly as the person who insulted him on the 6th of September 1994. Why would he say that you did it if you did that not? That is what doubts me. Because why should I insult him? What did he do to me? That will warrant me to this day to insult him just like that. Just like that. Like I said, even their removal from the cells to number one was just on order. But me alone, I, I, was, I, was, I was not bold enough to, to do it without order. So, so it has seized me by surprise for him mentioning my name that I insulted him. Out of what? Out of what? Well, Mr. Njai, thank you for that. We will have to move on. But I note the time, um, Madam Chair. Perhaps we could take the lunch break, um, the coffee break now, and then resume. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Witness. We will take a break now and come back at midday. Thank you.